we're coming on the air with Ukrainians doing whatever they can to get out of the line of fire as Russia launches hundreds of missiles, including at TV towers, even a Holocaust memorial site in Kyiv. Coming up, we'll hear from a mother and daughter just trying to survive. Plus, U.S. intelligence officials say they're worried that Vladimir Putin's getting so frustrated with the Ukrainian resistance, he might actually escalate the violence there. We're live in Moscow with more on how the world is trying to isolate the Kremlin. And this just in, right as I was walking to the set, Apple just announcing it's going to stop selling products there. We'll take you live to Moscow and here in Washington. Ukraine is one of several topics you know President Biden will be talking about in tonight's State of the Union. How he'll make his pitch to the nation at a key moment for him and his administration. We're also going to get real about how these kinds of big deal speeches actually come together with a special edition of our Backstory segment featuring someone who used to do that very job for former President Obama. And while all this is going down, you've got the midterms officially kicking off tonight in Texas with a first look at how people will deal with the state's restrictive new voter laws. We've got more on the problems some folks are running into with a live report later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie. And tonight, you've got this new stage in the war in Ukraine with more civilians, just people trying to survive in the line of fire with this huge 40-mile convoy of Russian tanks that was supposedly inching toward Kyiv, apparently actually stalled. That's according to a senior defense official telling us the convoy, this is some of the video of that, not moving all that much. Right now, about 20 miles from the capital, you've got the Russians running out of food and gas and, in the words of that official, reevaluating to figure out what they need to do now in the face of Ukrainian resistance. The Ukrainians aren't seeing much of this on TV right now, and here's why. TV there is temporarily down after that missile strike hit Kyiv's TV tower, killing at least five people. And it comes as more parts of a different city, Kharkiv, are being targeted. This on your screen, this is what it looked like after an explosion hit the main government building, a direct hit. One woman telling NBC News she spent the night sheltering from this in a basement with neighbors and family and her five-month-old baby. It's similar over in Mariupol, the city's mayor, saying attacks have killed women and children, including a six-year-old girl. So today, President Zelensky is calling Russia very clearly a terrorist state. This is him. He's talking directly to European Parliament from a bunker, again asking to get his country fast-tracked into the EU. And when he was finished, a standing ovation there. I want to start with Cal Perry, who was on the ground in in Ukraine. Cal, we know the military in Russia has launched hundreds of missiles into Ukraine. We're seeing that assault from the air. We know that more civilians seem to be targeted. Give me the feeling where you are right now. It feels like we're at an inflection point here. As you sort of laid out, you know, there's this column that is headed for Kyiv. It feels like the Russians are at least reassessing their battle plan. So in a way that only our viewers have become accustomed to in the last few years, prepare that split screen moment, right, where the president's going to be talking and it's likely that Kyiv is going to be shelled. It's being shelled right now. We're hearing fresh explosions from the capital. Those are the reports that are coming out. And of course, all of this is creating a humanitarian crisis, a nightmare for a country that is already fighting a battle in the east, now facing um, this very difficult situation here in the west. As you said, 650,000 people have already left this country. We know the numbers for internally displaced people are going to be far higher. I spent part of the day, again, at this Lviv train station where you have soldiers headed in one direction, young men who have just dropped their families off at the Polish border headed in one direction, and as they head that way, they're faced with this scene of people coming scared and confused and tired and exhausted, carrying only what they could with them, trying to get their families out. I had a chance to talk to a 12-year-old girl who was educated in Canada and her mother. I asked them just to talk a little bit about what it is they're going through. Take a little listen to that report. Russia is just killing people for no reason. Now he have to uh, defend his country and we live, we stay in Ukraine with him and we have to support our husband, our men, our armies. And so you have a deteriorating situation also because of the weather. There are people sleeping outside. It is cold here. It is wet here. Folks who can't find anywhere to go are stuck in this city. Other people are trying for the border. Uh, But it's getting worse and worse, Hallie. And it's only going to get worse as the fighting spreads. There's There's this phrase that I hear more and more of in Washington, and that is war crimes. We heard it. I know you're hearing it where you are from President Zelensky in Ukraine. A significant statement given that you have the International Criminal Court, the ICC, opening an investigation into whether Russia is committing war crimes. 
and let's be honest about this. I, I think people were ready for this before the war even started. The Russians in Syria were bombing hospitals. They were indiscriminately killing civilians. This is proven. This is not me saying this. This has been proven by international tribunals, international courts. And so people were aware of this. We were at a hospital just yesterday. And in doing our report, we were talking to the hospital staff, and they were very happy we were there. We were getting supplies as they came off the back of the van, and they, they wanted that information out there. But what they didn't want out there was the name of the hospital and the location of the hospital. People here are keenly aware of how Russia has been in previous conflicts, mm. be it Grozny in 1994, be it Syria more recently. People are aware of it. They are terrified that the Russians, if they cannot move as quickly as they want to, will do things like possibly encircle Kiev and just bomb it and just bomb it. And we heard from a general in Russia over the weekend who said maybe we'll create a humanitarian corridor to let civilians out. The implicit message there was if you remain behind, you could be killed. And that's what's scaring people here. Real quick, Cal, you know, it seems like what Putin has done is, is only accelerate Ukraine's entry onto sort of the, the European stage. You have what, what I referenced right at the top of the show, the idea that, you know, we know Zelensky wants to get into the EU. You saw that standing ovation from the European Parliament today. What's the status on that front? So they said they'll fast track the application. It's a little bit kind of ridiculous because there's nothing fast about joining the European Union, but they're fast tracking the application, which means they've accepted the application. But the political point that he's making is if this was part of the European Union where I'm standing right here, there'd be no border with Poland. All of those refugees, all of those internally displaced people would be able to flow into Poland and into Europe. Now, there are plenty of countries in Europe that are not going to be thrilled with that idea, but the political point still stands. He wants this country to be a part of Europe, and, and your point is the right one. He's pushing Ukraine. Right. Vladimir Putin is pushing Ukraine into the arms of Europe and into the arms of NATO. Cal Perry, live for us in Lviv. Cal, thank you for being up late for us there tonight. I appreciate it. You got this pressure growing on every side for Putin and his government, as we've seen the economy really hit hard because of these sanctions from the international community. And we said it at the top of the show, just happening just into us, Apple distancing itself from Russia now. The company has just announced it's going to stop selling products there because of the invasion. They've also restricted apps for Russian state news outlets, RT and Sputnik. Now you can only see those outlets in Russia. And then today, you talk about split-screen moments. We showed you that standing ovation for President Zelensky in Ukraine. Look what happened here to the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov. Yeah, that's everybody there standing up, turning their backs on him to protest this invasion while he was delivering a speech in Geneva. All of it, putting more and more pressure on Vladimir Putin. And from the tea leaves we can read and from what we're hearing from reporting from the defense officials that our teams are talking to and elsewhere, it seems like Putin is getting more and more frustrated. Intel agencies say he's lashing out. They're worried that that frustration may lead him to step up the violence, basically. Kier Simmon joins us now from Moscow. And Kier, there's a bunch of pieces of this. Let me start with Apple. Listen, big company. Yeah. Everybody knows Apple now saying, hey, they too yeah. are not OK with their products being sold in Russia, trying to send a signal to Putin that this is not OK. Yeah, and, you know, you can imagine that there are millions of Russians who uh, don't get to buy Apple products and uh, it won't impact them, but it will impact the middle classes here in Moscow and cities like this, uh, St. Petersburg, and, and that does have an impact because, of course, it is the middle class society that often sustains a leader. And in the case of uh, President Putin, he does need to keep the big cities like Moscow behind him, not just the, the rural areas, not just the older generation who watch state television and I believe what, what they uh, watch. But, you know, Hallie, as we prepare to hear from President Biden speaking to Congress, speaking to the American people, speaking to the world, another president, President Putin here in Moscow, is trying to limit what people here in Russia uh, get to know about what's happening in Ukraine. So Radio Echo Moscow, an independent radio station, has been closed down uh, today. Its broadcast has been closed down. We think you can still hear it uh, on the Internet. The Wikipedia site, uh, Wikipedia Russia, says it's been threatened by the Russian prosecutor with being closed down over its uh, post-invasion of Ukraine 2022. So uh, truth is having a less and less of a place here in Russia, as the truth is that President Putin's campaign in Ukraine struggles. Struggles, the question is for how long, right, Kier? And this is a question that I've been trying to get at from folks right. that I'm talking to in Washington, because Russia is obviously a military superpower. And you see this assessment now coming into yeah. us from the reporting that our teams are doing, that perhaps there is a real concern. Putin is frustrated and may just yeah. unleash in a way that is going to be devastating, potentially, to people in Ukraine. 
Yeah, there's a saying from another European war, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. And so that's the true of all uh, conflicts. Uh, but, you know, this one, I think, is showing signs of difficulties at the top. The plans that President Putin had are not coming to fruition. And I think part of the reason why we might be hearing these reports of President Putin being angered by this is actually, when you look back at previous Russian campaigns, Crimea in 2014, uh, for example, there do appear to have been, despite the fact that it was seen as, as a success, there do appear to have been log logistical issues emerging, supply-side issues emerging. So Putin may well be furious that those things haven't been fixed. It kind of reminds you of another European war, uh, World War One. The leaders of that war, the general of course, so out of touch with their people on, on the ground. So, you know, I think uh, there are real, cons real problems for the Russians. That's not to say uh, from a military standpoint that they won't be able to fix them. But as you mentioned, they may be trying to fix them with terrible bloodshed, right. uh, more violence. And again, in the end, the problem for President Putin is he began this by saying this is not going to be an occupation of Ukraine. But the more that he has to use terrible violence, the more he turns the Ukrainian people against against him, which means, well, what's the exit plan? That's it. Keir Simmons, I appreciate the view from Moscow and for your uh, reporting and analysis, as always, with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. You've got the other piece of this invasion, right, which is what the U.N. is saying could be Europe's biggest refugee crisis this century. We are seeing something like 660,000 people, they say, who have now left Ukraine, 100,000 more than when we talked 24 hours ago on this show. On this show. And these are just some of the people whose lives have been changed in a matter of days. Women, kids, families, many of them waiting at the Polish border, the Romanian border, the, Moldo the Moldovan border, sometimes for as long as 60 hours. One mom realizing just how fast it took for everything to fall apart. Watch. <laughs> So EU leaders are meeting Thursday, and they may approve a temporary solution to all this. Countries would be allowed to bypass the usual, usual refugee procedures and speed up some of the processing that they need so desperately right now. Kelly Kobie is there. You might have seen her in that shot we just showed, actually. She is joining us now from Poland. Kelly, tell me how the situation has evolved in the last 24 hours. I know you've been out there, as we just saw, talking to folks about this. Yeah, Hallie, it has improved in terms of just getting people processed, getting people off of those trains that are arriving at that very small uh, train station at the border, getting them through border and customs, and then on to wherever they may land. A lot of people are staying in private homes, they're staying with relatives, they're staying with friends, uh, they're spreading out to different cities. Some are staying in schools and in churches and sports halls, uh, but, but, but a lot of people are staying uh, with friends. We spoke to to the daughter uh, of Olga, uh, who told us about just how quickly uh, everything happened for her. Take a listen. Oh, actually, we don't have that, I'm told. Um, but, but she talked about uh, hearing uh, gunshots and uh, sounds of war, essentially, in the next morning, her mother waking her up and saying, we have to go. Pack your bag. Uh, it was really that quick. And, and she, she and her sister said that they took their two dogs and their pet guinea pig. And she showed me <laughs> their pet guinea pig. But it's just, you know, it's absolutely heartbreaking, Hallie, when you talk to some of these families and about what they're going through. And the fact that they're leaving fathers, brothers, right. um, husbands behind. And that was the case for this family. And, and the reason for that, of course, is because men between 18 and 60 have to stay in Ukraine, basically. So you're seeing, Kelly, not just the unimaginable pain of people having to leave their homes. Oh, but, I think I've... But as you know, to leave their families, too. Kelly, do, you, do you still you. have us? Kelly Kobiaev, you can hear me? All right. Kelly, live yeah, for us there lost. from Poland. Uh, we appreciate her reporting, being on the front lines there, of this growing humanitarian crisis. That is, again, one of the pieces of this story. The other is what we're hearing from Ukraine's President Zelensky, who's really asking President Biden to go even further with sanctions, economic penalties with Russia. After they talked on the phone this afternoon, you can see here the president on the phone, a picture that I believe the White House has given us. They talked for just about a half an hour, and, yeah, that's a White House photo on that. We had heard Mr. Zelensky talk about how negotiations between Ukraine and Russia went a few days ago and what it would take to end all this violence. 
it began five, six, today six, six days ago. Yes. I think th there are principal things you can do it, and that is very important moment. If you do this, and if those side is ready, it means that they are ready for the peace. We know that President Biden and his team have been reworking his State of the Union coming up in just a couple of hours. You'll see it live right here on NBC News Now to more heavily emphasize some of the, what you're looking at here, right? The Russian escalation in Ukraine, what is happening in Ukraine. He's planning to look specifically, too, at the effort between the U.S. and its allies, the penalties the U.S. has put in place on Russia. Let me bring in Caroline now at the latest out of the White House. And, Carol, so, so that people know... You know, oftentimes on a State of the Union, it's tradition for a president to host news anchors for an off the record sort of sit down, usually a luncheon. President Biden was talking with our own Lester Holt, who was there on the record about specifically his message as it relates to Ukraine, what he wants the American people to know about. Give us a preview. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. The, he was asked, what is the most important thing that you want to convey in your speech as it, regard, as it pertains to Ukraine? And I'll read you part of, of what the president said. He said, essentially, that this is what he wants to convey is unity, unity among America and its allies. And he said, my determination to see to it that the EU, NATO, and our allies are on the same exact page in terms of sanctions against Russia and how we deal with the invasion and it is an invasion of Ukraine, he says, because that's the one thing that gives us power to impose severe consequences on Putin. So the president saying that his message is the world needs to continue to stand united and standing together and keeping and maintaining that unity is really ultimately what might change the situation in Ukraine. However, huge caveat, the president said that over the long term, this is not something he's talking about in the short term. Anyone in the administration that I've talked to is still very much thinks that this is going to get much worse before it gets better and that they just don't think that Vladimir Putin has changed yeah. his, his goals here in terms of going in and ultimately taking Kyiv. There's this question of not just Russia's actions being classified as war crimes. There's this question that's out there, too, um, that has been raised in reporting about what is Vladimir Putin's state of mind. There's also a question, and I talked with the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee about this just within the last couple hours, Carol, of could there be a no-fly zone put in place over Ukraine? The White House has, has been very cool to that idea. And Senator Menendez, too, said, well, he doesn't want to shut the door on it. That opens a whole new can of worms that doesn't seem particularly you know, useful or, or a line that the U.S. wants to cross right now. Yeah, and it reminds me, Sally, of, or Hallie, sorry, Mick, I'm hearing these protests. I know, me, that's um, okay. Of the, of the debate that the, some of the same people in the administration had about Syria a few years ago and fly, creating a fly zone there, and the reason they don't want to do it is exactly the same. It's that it draws you into a military conflict, and what we've heard from White House officials is, you know, look, somebody has to maintain a no-fly zone. This is not just some, you know, magic carpet that get laid, gets laid out and nobody has to patrol it and, and survey it. And so if Russian planes were to cross that airspace, they would have to shoot them down. And that gets them into right. a hot war with Russia, and they don't want to do that. Also, the NATO Secretary General, Halley, has said this is just not something that NATO allies want to do. You know, Carol, you mentioned that we hear the horns, we hear the voices behind you. <laughs> we, we often hear yeah. um, that from your perspective, where you are for this live shot. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's more of it tonight. Because of the State of the Union, this is a really key moment for President Biden, as you well know. We'll be talking more about that later on tonight. But yeah. this is a significant moment for him to address millions of Americans in prime time, not just on the crisis in Ukraine and what Russia is doing, but also as the White House, I'm sure, hopes to try to highlight what they see as his accomplishments over the last year. Yeah, I mean, you know this because you've covered a number of these. This is the largest audience a president typically will get in any year. And it has the microphone. It's prime time. And so you want to make the most of that if you're a White House. And what we're told is the president, obviously, he has to talk about Ukraine far more than he would have expected to in the early drafts of his speech. But he also is going to talk about the economy. He's going to talk about inflation. He's going to have to talk about gas prices. Gas prices are spiking. His climate change agenda, his legislative agenda. The president hasn't pushed anything legislatively since that stalled effort on voting rights and before that a stalled effort on his Build Back Better plan. So you can see there is pandemic response. How is he going to talk about the pandemic? An interesting visual will be, you know, some of the changes in the pandemic will just be inherent because 
not everyone's going to be wearing a mask this time. And so all of those things are, are on top of mind for Americans, and it's also something, therefore, that the president's going to want to address. And empathy, Hallie, that's the one thing that we've been told for several weeks the president's going to try to convey more empathy, basically saying, look, I know it's really bad. I get it. Yeah. I'm here. I'm trying. Carol Lee, uh, outside the White House. Carol, thank you. We'll be seeing more of you tonight on NBC News Now. Appreciate it. First election night of the 2022 midterms is happening in Texas. And because it's a primary, voters are deciding who will represent their parties come November. This is also, call it what it is, right? It's the first statewide test for Texas's new voting law, which adds some new rules on things like voter identification and mail-in ballots. We're hearing and our teams are hearing from some local officials that they're already seeing the impact of this. Look at Harris County, for example. It's the, it has the biggest population in the state. Almost a third of the mail-in ballots that they've gotten so far have been flagged for errors. All those people will now have to go make corrections in person or else their vote won't count. For the latest on what's happening there, let's bring in NBC's Antonia Hilton live from Houston, which, by the way, is in Harris County. So, Antonia, you're on the ground. You're eyes and ears there. Tell us what you're seeing. Well, Hallie, I am at one of the busiest polling locations in Harris County, which, as you said, is the most populous county in the entire state. And many of the voters who I've spoken to here, especially Democratic voters, say that voting rights and, in general, just the state of our democracy is top of mind for them this cycle, particularly in the shadow of the passage of this new election law, which got rid of 24-hour voting. It got rid of uh, uh, drive-through voting, which were two measures that were popular with people concerned about their health in the pandemic. It added potential criminal penalties for election workers who solicited or encouraged people to take part in mail-in voting. And then when it came to mail-in voting, it had a new ID requirement, which required people to submit the exact identification number that matched whatever they first used when they first registered to vote, something that has proved to be quite difficult for elderly voters here who ended up registering, in many cases, decades ago and are having trouble, in many cases, remembering what numbers they originally used. So thousands of mail-in ballots were flagged for rejection, and people are worried their voices aren't going to be heard. Take a listen to a conversation I had with one voter who tried to help some elderly people earlier during the early voting period and saw many of them fail. I believe it was to minimize minority votes, period, straight, no chaser. Because of the demographics in Texas are flipping quicker than anybody anticipated. And in just a few years, and I mean that, Texas is going to be Democrat. It will be. They are concerned about that. The demographics do not lie. The redistricting does. And the concern here among these voters is not actually just limited to SB1. There's also the passage of SB8 in Texas, which uh, famously restricted abortion rights here. There is also the new announcement from the governor and attorney general here about potential investigations of transgender uh, children and their parents for child abuse for receiving gender-affirming care. And so there is sort of a widespread anxiety here about the state of the democracy in Texas and around the country and the potential rollback of people civil rights tally. NBC's Antonia Hilton live for us there in Texas. Antonia, thank you. Coming up here on this show. So what does it really take to write a State of the Union speech? In tonight's backstory, we get a behind the scenes look at that process. I'm joined by former President Obama's speechwriter next, plus a look at past State of the Unions and some of the most memorable moments. So how might tonight's measure up? That's later on in the hour. Tonight, you have mothers and children sheltering in the basement of a children's hospital in Kyiv. They're trying to take cover from Russia's attacks. We're talking about some of these kids who have cancer. They're really sick. They cannot be moved. And they now have to keep up with their treatments while Russian missiles and bombs are falling. Imagine that. Think about what that might be like. You've also got this hospital, the same hospital, taking in kids, young patients who have been hurt from the violence that is devastating their country. Deborah Haynes takes us inside one of Kyiv's main pediatric hospitals. Watch. The trauma of war in a children's hospital. This boy was hit by gunfire as Russian forces advanced on Ukraine's capital. Just 14 years old, he suffered face, back and leg wounds three nights ago. His latest procedure described as minor surgery. Russia's invasion prompted medics to set up this makeshift emergency department 
three children have been brought in so far, including a 10-year-old who died en route. That was the quiet place with just kids, with the scheduled operations, and now, in one moment, it changes. So, okay, this is war. We are and Two days ago, we have the gunfights all around the block with the artillery fights, etc., etc. But this night was a little bit calm. So, and uh, the war changes the priority. So now, if you can take a shower and take a coffee, it is luxury. <laughs> He's barely slept. As well as preparing to treat war casualties, he and his colleagues have an equally vital job to do. Here in the emergency department, the doctors are tired, they're worried about an influx of more patients, and they're also worried about what to do with the very sick children who are being treated in this hospital before the war started. The lights are off because of the, we should be like, nobody should see us. Four-year-old Nikita has leukemia. He receives chemotherapy and blood transfusions. The little boy also has Down syndrome. But usually, uh, usually children should not be in the corridor. The noise you can hear is his teeth grinding, something he's done since Russian missiles started falling. This is where he should be treated but his mother now has to shuttle up and down from the basement where it's safer for them to stay. How are you feeling dealing with all of this? I'm sorry to ask. You know, uh, trembling, hands are trembling, um, um, legs are like you're, uh, you are in fitness gym because downstairs um, 10,000 uh, meters a day, uh, steps a day, uh, up and down with children, with bags. She wants to take him out of the country, but it's hard. Our children can't live uh, without hospital, without medical treatment. You, you know, it's just uh, a few days and that's all. So we should, if we will go to another country, we should uh, cross uh, the border, but with a doctor. They're not alone. Other children dealt the same cruel blows, fighting life-threatening disease in the middle of a war zone and with Russian forces closing in on the capital. Deborah Haynes, Sky News, Kyiv. Our thanks to Deborah for that important reporting. And we have to note here, you do have relief agencies looking to step up to help the millions of people in Ukraine, like those kids who desperately need medical supplies. They need food, they need safe drinking water. If you want to help, take a quick screen grab of this, take a picture with your phone, visit redcross.org, or call the number you see, 1-800-RED-CROSS. You can also text Red Cross to 90999. Still ahead. Those deadly floods in Australia are getting worse and forcing tens of thousands of people from their homes. We've got an update on that coming up in The Five Things. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the January 6th Select Committee has issued subpoenas for six people who they say spread lies about the 2020 presidential election. The committee's chairman in a statement said this is part of the panel's investigation into the attack on the Capitol and that they want testimony and records from those people. The panel expects them to cooperate. Number two, tens of thousands of people in Australia on the southeast coast have been forced to leave their homes today. Remember last night we told you how the country is seeing its worst flooding in more than a decade? Well, you can see it by these pictures here. It is not letting up. You have rescue teams going in, trying to get people out of cars that they're trapped in, trying to get people off of roofs. At least 10 people have been killed in these floods. Number three, workers at some Target stores could start getting paid as much as $24 an hour starting this year. Target says it's raising its minimum wage from 15 bucks to 24 an hour to try to be more competitive in places like New York. The company says it's also planning to spend big bucks to give its employees better access to health care, too. Number four, the House of Representatives is awarding the Congressional Gold Medal to the only all-female black unit to serve in Europe in World War II. The unit, known as the 6888, was known for solving a big male crisis in the UK and became role models for black women who joined the military, for many of them. Some lawmakers calling this a long overdue honor and recognition. Number five, we talked about Ukrainian refugees just a minute ago in the show. Well, now Airbnb says it's offering free temporary housing to 100,000 people who have been forced to flee since Russia's invasion. That's being paid for with help from Airbnb hosts and donations to the company's refugee fund. 
All of this, of course, setting up what could be a split screen moment for President Biden in just really a couple of hours from now when he delivers his State of the Union speech. But the world will also be watching what is happening in Ukraine with Russia's escalation there. Just moments ago, the chief of staff talked with our Lester Holt. He seemed to downplay the possibility of the president delivering a speech tonight at the same moment, right, downplaying the possibility of a split screen. But here's what else Ron Klain told Lester. Watch. And depending what happens in Kyiv tonight, could we be looking at a split screen moment? Is there concern Vladimir Putin might want to upstage the president? Uh, look, the concern is that six days ago, Vladimir Putin launched an unjustified, unprecedented uh, assault on Ukraine. The concern is that he continues to target civilians in Ukraine. I care less about what hour of the day or night this happens and more about the fact that what Vladimir Putin is doing in Ukraine is wrong. And that's why the United States has assembled this amazing coalition led by President Biden, joined by leaders from around the globe to devastate the Russian economy as a result. Uh, we're down to now, now it takes more than 100 rubles to buy a single U.S. dollar. Their stock market's been unable to open this week. Russian inflation's over 20 percent. So they are paying a price for what they're doing, whatever hour of the day and night they do it. You can catch more of that interview. And again, we're just hearing this from Ron Klain, right? This is just getting turned around. You saw the first excerpt of it here. More at 6.30 Eastern on the Nightly News with Lester Holt. As we talk about that speech, let's talk about what President Biden is expected to say. As of, I think, three and a half minutes ago, we've gotten the first excerpts from the White House on that front. I want to bring in NBC's Carol Lee back, because, Carol, we, we got you back in front of a camera. Based on these excerpts, and I've only been able to skim them in my email, like during the last commercial break, you know, the president is going to pretty directly take on Vladimir Putin, which is not surprising based on what he said before. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. He's going to directly say Putin was wrong in terms of thinking that he could divide US, the U.S. and its uh, European allies and that we were ready, in the president's words. I'll read you part of what he said. He also talks about how throughout history, history we've learned this lesson when dictators do not pay a price for their aggression, they cause more chaos. They keep moving and the costs and the threats to America and the world keep rising. The president also talks about how NATO, the NATO alliance was aligned on this, that the U.S. has led on that. And, and essentially, he says, diplomacy matters. So that's something that President Biden has focused on since he's taken office, that he would emphasize diplomacy. And he's saying that he that work actually paid off and the U.S. and its allies were together and united. And in the end, as I said, Putin was wrong. We were ready. Carol Lee at the White House. Carol, thank you for bringing us those excerpts. The early look at what we will hear from President Biden in just a few hours. It actually tees us up really well for this next segment, our backstory. You know, viewers of the show, it's the behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into the bigger picture. And as we talk about President Biden's State of the Union, listen, backdrop, big audience, right? Probably the biggest audience for a president all year long in most cases. And that's something that his team works on for months, right? The State of the Union doesn't just sneak up on folks by surprise. They know it's coming. They work to find exactly the right tone. Somebody who knows a lot about writing those important speeches is John Favreau, who was the chief speechwriter for former President Barack Obama back in 2012, a decade ago now. Favreau was part of a White House video giving a sneak peek at what goes into a speech like this. Check it out. Finished the first draft, first complete draft last night on Monday night. And now we're going to meet with the president. He had uh, lots and lots of thoughts and gave all kinds of edits, comments like this. Cody and I are now rewriting, reordering, re-editing. John, who is now the co-host of Crooked Media's new podcast, Offline, joins me now to talk more about it. John, baby John, that was a nice glimpse oh. from a decade ago. You and Cody looking like kids, you know? Looking like kids who hadn't slept in weeks. Well, because you probably didn't. <laughs> We're so glad to have you, John. And as I as I said, and I this is your first time on for this segment, so thank you and welcome because it's me. it's a little different. We really want to try to pull back the curtain on like what is it really like, right? Your experience, like tell us what it was creating a speech like this for for a president. It's a big deal. It doesn't just pop up out of nowhere. But you know that when you worked for you know former President Obama, stuff came up and you had to maneuver and rework and rewrite right up until the last minute. Right. Yeah. I mean, usually it started around Thanksgiving. We'd have our first meetings about what was going to go in the speech. 
And the president would sort of lay out the themes of what he wanted included. We'd also talk to all every policy advisor in every department of the White House, every cabinet agency um, over the next couple of weeks. And then we'd figure out, OK, this is the policy that's going in the speech. This is the uh, these are the accomplishments we're going to talk about. Here's the theme. Uh, and then we'd get working on the actual draft. And we would usually have a draft around Christmas. Uh, we'd send it to the president when he was in Hawaii. He would say he was going to look at it while he was in Hawaii, but because he was in Hawaii on vacation, he never did. And so then we had a last-minute sprint in the in the couple first couple weeks in January uh, between when we got back from break and when the speech was to try to get the speech in order and basically keep it all within around an hour. Right. Was always the challenge. Every single time I've asked this next question, the person I've asked says, well, so-and-so wrote every single word of it, right? Which I know, but, like, how involved was President Obama? You know, because we know that President Biden's been working with his team, especially lately on this. But, like, was this red pen crossing it out, you know, on the iPad, getting in there kind of thing? Yes. I mean, we're always, of course, supposed to say as speechwriters that the president writes everything. But President Obama, because he was a writer, because uh, he wrote two books right. before he became president, really was involved pretty pretty uh, intimately. And he would be up till two or three in the morning sending us edits. We'd get the draft back and there would just it would be covered in black little marker and his like neat little lefty handwriting. Uh, so he would get very, very involved, particularly as we get closer to the end. And it was focused mainly like we've gotten the argument down. Then he wanted to focus on language and rhythm. And he'd be making edits right up until the day of. There is an optical piece to this, too, for any state of the union. Like it is what it's a prime time address. It's a rare opportunity for a president to to deliver a speech to all Americans across all networks at the same time. How much are you thinking about things like guests in the first lady's box. We know, for example, First Lady Jill Biden will have the Ukrainian ambassador, you know, and other guests we've found out in the box for tonight's speech. How much are you thinking about that and weaving that through in those moments when you know the president's going to call out people in the audience? Yeah, look, I think the way we did it is if there were new stories that we wanted to highlight, if there were people doing heroic, courageous things we wanted to highlight, we would include that in the speech and then invite the guests to the State of the Union. So it would, it would go that way. We wouldn't just have guests and then figure out how to incorporate them in the speech. Um, but look, I, I know that President Biden and his team are still working on the speech as we speak right now, <laughs> even though there are excerpts out. I know they're making last minute edits. And that happens too. I mean, I remember in 2011, um, we had had a draft of the speech done. And then there was that horrific shooting in Tucson. That's right. Um, when, when Congresswoman Giffords was shot. And we rewrote most of the beginning of the speech based on what happened there, uh, particularly knowing who would be in the audience and, and, and what he'd want to say there. You also were involved in the speech of the State of the Union after Osama bin Laden was killed. That was a huge moment, right? Yeah, and in that speech, uh, I remember that we ended because the president had told us the story about how the SEALs involved in the raid had given him the flag. Uh, that was uh, that they had carried it with them into the raid. And he kept that flag and he used it to tell a story about unity in this moment where, you know, the country was so divided. These SEALs who had come from all different walks of life and everyone in his White House, from Robert Gates, who had been a Republican, to Hillary Clinton, who he had run against once, everyone came together because they were focused on the mission. And he used it to tell a story at the end of the speech about what America can achieve when we come together. Um, one of the many memorable moments, I think, from States of the Union, you know, throughout the throughout the years. Let me ask you this, John. If, hypothetically, you were to be playing some kind of drinking game, not that we endorse that with President Biden, State of the Union tonight, what are the phrases, what are the words that you're looking and listening for? You know what I mean? What do you think is going to come up the most here tonight? I mean, it depends on what's in the speech versus what Biden says. You know, sometimes he can say the word <laughs> literally. I'm telling you, you know, if, I, if, if you drink every time he said the word literally, we might get a, a little tipsy. Um, but I'm wondering how much he'll talk about Ukraine, how much he'll talk about, um, and not just the war, but the global struggle between democracy and autocracy. That's been a theme of his throughout the campaign, throughout his presidency. And I'm guessing he'll probably start the speech talking about that and use it as a segue to get into more domestic politics after he talks about Ukraine at the beginning. John Favreau, it's great to have you. Thank you for being on for the backstory. Come back. Maybe next year. We'll Thanks talk more. Me. We'd love to have you. Appreciate it. Of course. It. Coming up next, a Republican lawsuit looking to throw out absentee voting in Arizona. What it means for the midterms there, coming up in the local. And the anticipation tonight, not just for President Biden's State of the Union, but that's the biggie. People are also waiting on the rebuttal. And tonight, there are more than one. That's after the break.
We got some new developments just into us on that MLB lockout we've been talking about. And if you're a fan of baseball, oof. You may not love the news. We're going to get to that in a little bit. But first, NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day around the world. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our West Coast Bureau, Arizona's Republican Party wants the state Supreme Court to throw out absentee voting. There's this lawsuit they filed that says absentee voting is, quote, unconstitutional. 90% of voters there... Battleground state, remember, vote by mail. It's a big deal ahead of this year's midterms. We'll watch that one. From our Southeast Bureau, Mardi Gras back in action in full swing in New Orleans. Check it out. People are on the streets today to celebrate Fat Tuesday. It's the first full out Mardi Gras the city's hosted since 2020, right before the pandemic hit. Masks right now are only required indoors in public there. And from our Northeast Bureau, if a wicked Boston accent grinds your gears, you are not alone. I'm sorry to our friends in Boston, but a new survey says you have the most annoying accent in the country. I said I was sorry. Don't shoot the messenger. If it's any comfort to Bostonians, you did rank at number four for sounding smart. Although New York's accent took the top spot for that one. I would have said Philly or South Jersey, but that's just me. We've been talking about the president's State of the Union and this year's response to it, because, you know, the other party gets an opportunity to respond, is seeing a little bit more interest, maybe a little bit more controversy, you could say, than we've seen in years past. You've got Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds set to give the GOP response. But then you have progressive Democratic Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib also set to give a response from the Working Families Party. Typically, you know, the response is meant to give the opposite party a chance to make a counter argument. And over the years, that strategy has worked for some, but not everybody NBC's Vaughn Hilliard explains. The State of the Union speech, an opportunity for the President of the United States to speak to millions of Americans in prime time. But if you keep the TV on long enough, you'll see a speech after the speech. We have just heard the President of the United States address our nation. Now, the Republican response. It's called the rebuttal or response, given usually by the opposing party, meant to make their own voice heard too. The rebuttal to the president's speech has been happening for years, but it hasn't always been given in the public way we see today. Congressman Gerald Ford of Michigan. It wasn't until 1966 when former Senator Everett Dirksen and then House Minority Leader Gerald Ford took the rebuttal to primetime, recording a 30-minute speech that aired five days after the president's speech. We do, however, believe that we have a duty as elected representatives to present our views. But choosing who delivers the rebuttal can be a strategic move. Sometimes it goes to a potential presidential prospect, like in 1996 with Bob Dole, who went on to win the Republican nomination later that year. The president claims to embrace the future while clinging to the policies of the past. Other times, it can be an up-and-coming party leader with the intention of launching their national profile. But then there were the rebuttals that flopped, like former Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal in 2009. Good evening and happy Mardi Gras. I'm Bobby Jindal, Governor of Louisiana. Whose struggles with delivery led to bipartisan ridicule, later admitting that he blew it in his autobiography. So here you have me, a guy who is teleprompter challenged, versus the king of the teleprompter. Bad matchup. There was also Republican Senator Marco Rubio's rebuttal in 2013, whose awkward water sip moment went viral and eventually defined his speech. And Democratic Representative Joe Kennedy in 2018, whose shiny lips drew unwanted attention, the congressman later blaming it on chapstick. Almost 40 years after then-Senator Joe Biden helped deliver the Democratic response. We can criticize the Republicans, and we will. We think, frankly, though, it's time we put up or shut up. This year's rebuttal goes to Iowa's Republican governor, Kim Reynolds, called a rising star within her party. A Des Moines Register Iowa poll from November showing her with an 88 percent approval rating among Republicans in her state. The goal? To bring the party's platform front and center in a midterm year. Joining me now is Vaughn Hilliard. Vaughn, let me make two points here. The, the state of the, 
there's a the, whether the state of the union itself actually moves the needle with voters is still kind of an open question. The state of the union response, you know, I had one person describe it to me as the thankless job because when you do it well, nobody really remembers it, and when you don't do it well, everybody remembers it for a long time, right? It's it's a tough gig to have, and now it's Kim Reynolds tonight. I've been spending most of the morning on the phone with you know sources and contacts on this uh, of what we can expect from her, and I'm told, listen, this is going to be a big contrast speech, COVID and the economy, two huge points for her. Explain why that's so important from Iowa's perspective and why that might be different, right? They're going to draw that contrast with the federal administration, with, with what the Biden administration has been doing. Right. And I think ultimately Kim Reynolds was a natural pick for this Republican Party that is still very much existing in the image of Donald Trump. You know, we talked about promoting some rising stars typically from the opposition party, but this is one where Donald Trump is still talking about running in 2024. And what you have in Kim Reynolds is a Midwest governor popular within her own po party and uh, a, from a state that Donald Trump was able to hold on to in 2020, while other Midwest states like Michigan and Wisconsin fell. And you have to deal with the reality that in Congress right now, Republicans are in the minority, in the House and in the Senate. So that is where you're able to turn to someone who at least the voters are looking at in these midterm elections as somebody they believe who has done an effective job and who is still viewed in a positive light by Donald Trump and, by and large, the rest of this Republican Party. Vaughn Hilliard, great to see you, Vaughn. Uh, thanks for being with us. I know you know a thing or two about Iowa, my friend, considering you live there uh, for a couple years. So appreciate your perspective. Thanks, thanks Vaughn. <laughs> Coming up here on the show, uh, we're going to talk more about some other stories as it relates to State of the Union. But we know that U.S. presidents have been giving these addresses dating back to George Washington. It's actually in the Constitution. The presidents from time to time will give Congress information on the State of the Union. That's what it says. The speech is meant to be the president's standout moment to address the country. But over the years, there have been moments unrelated to the speech itself, perhaps some candid moments, some funny moments that capture the spotlight going down in State of the Union history. Madam Speaker, the president of the United States. The State of the Union, historic, where the president of the United States has the opportunity to speak directly to millions of Americans. Almost every president in history has delivered this address in one way or another, in written form in the early days of the country, to in-person speeches on TV now. With each message, presidents looking to make their mark on history, some with memorable moments, like Lyndon B. Johnson introducing his agenda. And this administration today here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. Or George W. Bush outlining his path to fight terrorism after 9-11. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil, arming to threaten the peace of the world by seeking weapons of mass destruction. Other presidents have used their speeches to try to sidestep scandal. I believe the time has come to bring that investigation and the other investigations of this matter to an end. One year of Watergate is enough. Over the years, moments of tension, too. Remember House Speaker Nancy Pelosi ripping up Donald Trump's speech in 2020? But there have also been moments of levity, like Ronald Reagan in 1982, quoting the first State of the Union address by George Washington and chiding the press. For our friends in the press who place a high premium on accuracy, let me say, I did not actually hear George Washington say that. <laughs> Or former Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg caught on camera with her eyes closed multiple times. A viral moment the justice later blamed on not being 100 percent sober, reportedly having had wine at dinner before the address. And as we've seen recently, members of Congress have sometimes used what they wear to send a message, like some women lawmakers in 2018 who wore all black to show solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and then all white in 2019, a tribute to the suffragist movement. This year, it's President Biden's turn to deliver his first official State of the Union speech. And the question, how will his make history books? We will find out tonight together, 8 o'clock Eastern, right here on NBC News Now. Me, a bunch of my friends, a bunch of great experts, a bunch of our amazing reporters teeing you up for the big speech at 9 o'clock Eastern. We will see you right back here on NBC News Now. But don't go anywhere. Because this show's still going. And after the break, we have some late and not great developments in those baseball talks. Games are going to be missed for sure. We're going to tell you how many with Sam Brock next.
just into us. No deal, at least not tonight, with that lockout for MLB Major League Baseball. Another deadline coming and going with no agreement. We just heard from Commissioner Rob Manfred just within the last couple minutes confirming some regular season games are going to be canceled. Watch. The calendar dictates that we're not going to be able to play the first two series of the regular season, and those games are officially canceled. We're prepared to continue negotiations. We've been informed that the MLBPA is headed back to New York, meaning that no agreement is possible until at least Thursday. NBC Sam Brock is back with us following developments from the league office, the Players Association. I, we just saw it, Sam, so we knew this was coming. Games are canceled officially. The season is going to get messed up officially because of this lockout. What else did the commissioner say? Mm -hmm. Look, it's crushing, certainly, Hallie, because there was optimism. They extended the deadline another 17 hours in the hopes that these two sides could come to an agreement. So to find out that it's not going to happen right now, and it's almost certainly not going to happen for the next several days, is a huge disappointment. Commissioner Manfred said that they're going to definitely cancel MLB the first two series of the year. That is five or six games. But keep in mind, only 24 hours ago, there were reports MLB was starting to cancel a month of games. So maybe they've softened up their tone just a little bit, but there's going to be so many people that are angry, Hallie, and I'll tell you why. Because on December 2nd, that's when Major League Baseball locked out the players. They have had three months to get something done. And Commissioner Manfred was asked, why were you guys negotiating just in the last 24 to 36 hours? And he said, well, my response would be, really, you have to look at the last 10 days. And we didn't get momentum until, you know, the last eight, day eight or day nine. But you guys could have done something in the two and a half months prior to that. Did not happen. In 1994, that was the last lockout that was extended. It crushed baseball, Hallie. There were 948 games canceled. Let's hope we don't see a repeat of that. I'm not trying to, like, toot our horns here. We covered it in December. One of our first stories on this show when we launched was, like, the fact that this was happening. And there was some skepticism at the time, like, hey, we have three months. This may be nothing. This may not be an issue. And, look, here we are, you know, beginning of March. What are the sticking points that are left that are big? Like, what can they not get past here? If you had to boil it down to one thing, I really think you would have to say the number of young players who have not gotten paid yet, because for all of the Max Scherzers that make $43 million a year, that's the top of the pyramid, or Bryce Harper or Francisco Lindor or any of these guys, Mike Trout, that make $30 plus million a year, there's all these players, Hallie, more than half of the league that makes a million dollars or less, and many significantly less than that. Now, I know a lot of folks are going to be rolling their eyes, okay, right. you're only making five or $600,000 a year, but compared to the other sports, Sports. Baseball, the average salary, minimum salary is $570,000. Well, in the NFL, that's $660,000. In the NHL, that's $750,000. In the NBA, it's closer to a million. It's in the 900,000s. So this doesn't seem fair to anybody, especially when the revenues for baseball have gone up. There is also the issue of the CBT, which is basically a luxury tax. What does that mean? The big markets like New York and San Francisco and the Dodgers, they can all spend hundreds of millions of dollars. So baseball would put a cap on how high you can go before you start to get taxed. However, players want there to be more teams spending more money because then they'll make more money as well. It's all part of a larger pot. So they've been asking to move that luxury tax up, which makes sense. The big market teams actually are on board with that as well. But for the mid market, and and smaller market teams that can barely afford to stay afloat right now. They don't want the guys that already have a financial advantage to have an even greater financial advantage. That is probably the biggest sticking point right now where they land on this luxury tax. And negotiations, real quick, Sam, will pick up, I guess, no sooner than next week, per the commissioner? Rob Manfred said on Thursday would okay. be the earliest possibility uh, for them Thursday, to come together and come to an agreement. But there are canyon-sized differences here. Um, Sam, thank you. I'm losing track of my days. I, I forget what day of the week it is because it's been so nuts around here. Sam Brock, you're the best. Thanks for being <laughs> on with us. Thanks to all of you for watching. And keep in mind, we're just getting started. I got another show coming up, a special report, State of the Union coverage starting right here, 8 o'clock Eastern. Do not miss it. We got a big night planned. We'll see you then. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.